Hi, I'm Annie Matthew, um, looking after APAC Developer Relations uh, at Microsoft. Today, I'm very excited to talk to you about a topic that has been close to my heart for some time now, this elusive bridge between developer relations and sales. Ultimately, it boils down to developers and business. Three people are hired every minute on LinkedIn. Well, that's the good news. Software developer jobs are growing again. But the top skills that companies want are changing. And that is a reflection of the different times that we live in now. The jury is still out on whether it's a recession or not a recession. But the world around us is very recession-like. Think of recession as a sharp curve on an auto race track. What does the driver do? He does not stop the car completely when he reaches that sharp curve. He decelerates, reaches the turning point and kind of changes the direction to make sure that he crosses the apex, then turns direction again and accelerates to get to the outside apex. And then he goes from there. It's a very calculated move. Now, economists have been studying organizations and organization performances during recession and after recession. And they see a clear split between organizations which are winners and the others that they call losers. Well, the winners start with the end in mind. That's a big difference that they understood. That they're able to gauge that there is this sharp curve, they need to decelerate, but they also know they need to invest in some uh, right things. In today's context, it's, it's companies needing to know which customer segments to target. What's the new value proposition for our consumers because their behaviors have changed? And what are the digital technologies I need to invest in today to transform the business, which would give me that 14% of growth? Karl Popper is known as an information philosopher from the 20th century. He wrote a delightful essay on clouds and clocks. He talks about almost all systems lying somewhere in between these two extremes. Um, if you want to understand a clock, you can break open a clock, then put it back together and know precisely how the clock works. Whereas if you look at clouds, uh, you cannot break open a cloud literally, but that's an emergent system. Uh, emergent system in the sense that different elements interact with each other and create value. Now, if you look at digital transformation, it's truly an emergent system. We were talking about organizations and um, how they are facing changes in the current scenario. That means we need to take a closer look at the emergent forces and industries and let's look at retail. Um, so the big picture, safe and efficient stores, data demand planning, supply chain has completely changed. So you need agile, resilient, and, and suddenly supply chains need to be online rather than physical. All of those changes, including the big one, the BOPIS and BOPAC, which is buy online, pick up in store or buy online, pick up at counter. Those suddenly became the really emergent stuff. But underneath that, what this industry, what a company in this industry or an organization or a developer sitting inside this industry needs to look at is the whole AI revolution that needs to happen to unlock data insights from silos and intelligent systems and reimagining their stores entirely. So the culture of innovation uh, as Microsoft sees it is the synergy between these four forces or four dimensions. People, process, and technology we are familiar with from DevOps. Uh, well, data is a new part that becomes an inherent source of differentiation uh, and the driver of um, transformation. So who is sitting across all of this and just who can drive this innovation? This is to developers. If you accelerate developer velocity, you will lead the organization to outperform the market. It's almost like a point in time, an inflection point, if you will, 
where developers suddenly are at the heart of everything. This is a thought leadership we did with McKinsey and um, we looked at what is developer velocity index and it sits between three pillars, technology, working practices and organizational enablement. And it drives four to five X higher revenue growth, 55% higher innovation if you have high developer velocity. Now it's interesting uh, how the developer is sitting at the center of all this. Let us see how, uh, let us see some practical use cases and what I have seen of how developers respond to the situation. Philippines is not far from where I sit, I'm in Malaysia. Uh, it's an archipelago of more than 3,800 islands. Well, on March 7th, the Philippines Prime Minister declared code red, shoot its site orders. On April 3rd, the Rapid Pass Philippines was launched. What happened in this short time is a very interesting uh, story of how will leadership and synergy came together. I met Winston Damarillo about seven to eight months before March at Cagayan de Oro, a small island in Philippines. He's a founder of uh, DevCon, which has about 500, 600 developers or, or more, I think. So when he put out a call on March 16th, an open call on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, everywhere you could find saying that calling for developers to come join this volunteer army, which is going to create the most critical apps for Philippines. He got 1,093 volunteers. I saw this call on LinkedIn, reached out to Winston and said, hey, this is phenomenal what you're doing. How can we help? And he said, we need all the help we can get. Come on board. He reached out to the government and said, hey, I'm putting this developer team together. We want to solve the problem for you. So they put together 46 teams. They worked 90 days and uh, developed four critical apps. One was this trace COVID, uh, sorry, this rapid pass, which was for frontline workers to quickly pass through without contact and very quickly pass through uh, traffic gates. Uh, there was COVID trace, there was um, something around small, medium businesses coming back to business and things like that. So this inspired me terribly, how you can lead, but it was not just about creating apps, remember? It was about connecting the dots between community, government, private players like Microsoft and creating synergy there to deliver value. Another one from the retail uh, segment is ASOS. If this is a, a US organization, you might be buying from this. So when COVID, um, the, the pandemic hit, and their entire retail uh, servicing changed. They were very quickly able to come out with a, a See My Fit application, which is a virtual reality application where you can try on the clothes that you select, upload your picture, try on the clothes and see how it fits you and then make the purchase. And that would actually be hugely beneficial uh, for ASUS as well, not only for the con consumer because one, the consumer is super happy that they can see and then buy. Uh, and for ASOS, there were less recalls because people buy and then say, oh, it doesn't fit me well and send it back. So uh, it was amazing for both of them. How did they suddenly come up with that? So Tim Carey, the senior content manager, actually says that we were fortunate enough to have been experimenting with AR technology for a while. And that meant when this hit, we could suddenly scale this technology up at short notice rapid experimentation that is something uh, that's a skill that is required today flip to the other side of the world this is india and in my home country mintra is a huge uh, fashion uh, retail uh, online uh, fashion retail e-commerce and uh, amar nagaram the ceo of mintra mind you not the cto is talking about that the ceo is talking about how uh, the data that they learned from was about six to seven times more than pre-COVID. And just in time before pre-COVID that 
Azure had enabled them to scale up overnight. They used Azure Machine Learning, gave the right kind of levers uh, to expedite their learnings. So they could respond rapidly because they had already invested in technology. And they were actually already on to invested in technology that would help them solve complex business problems. And that's going to be a phenomenon now. It's not about simple it's more complex than before because of the massive shift in consumer behavior so developers are facing this don't just write code solve problems oh, well don't just write code solve the right problems and look at the developer sitting within that organization ultimately as developer relations our job is to make sure that the developer is successful so it's important that we look at the developer sitting in the context of a whole business where he is. It could be big, it could be small, it could be freelancing, whatever it is. But if there's an environment around the developer and there are certain things that will make the developer successful. And if you are interested in making the developer successful, then we have to look at these things. So the business is talking about, I have some critical business needs now um, and I need massive insights immediately i need to know what it means okay consumer behaviors has changed fine but what does it mean for my business from which areas should should i remove my stores uh what products uh, are needed mintra started uh, as i just mentioned mintra started uh, putting out a new season of clothes every week as opposed to a spring season and a winter season is that where retail is going and is that an a b testing they're doing so they need insights. And then, of course, there's this legacy uh, projects. And I suddenly know that there's no way out of this unless I digitally transform and cloud is essential. So how do I, what legacy projects do I keep? What transformation projects? So there's a whole lot of um, quick and urgent thinking on the business side. The developer on the other side is thinking about, OK, I understand that there are changes now. How do I prioritize? Um, I need more resources. I need new skills today because now I need to learn. Maybe I need to create a bot for this. I need to learn cognitive uh, technologies. I need to do some ML um, or I need to hire talent to do ML. I need to do some quick ideas and experimentation. Much like what the earlier speaker, Sigo San, was talking about uh, rapid prototyping. So the interesting thing inside the organization is that if the developer knows the business intent, then they are able to prioritize their projects. Am I working on a project um, that is okay to deliver in 12 months time? Should I be picking up another project that is a critical business need right now and give some insights right away? So those kind of uh, conversations and what skills do I need comes from business intent. And on the other side, the business is saying, Okay, I know I need to digitally transform. I need what? But what is my developer capability? Can they do this? Can they not do this? And how is this going to help? Uh, how are they going to help each other? In that scenario, look at sellers from our organization. There are sellers and there are us developer relations. We are working closely with the developer. The sellers are working closely with the business. They know that better. Uh, now, the sellers in this new scenario where developers are in the driving seat of transformation need to very quickly start understanding the developer. And that's a no-brainer. Whether the sellers know that or not, uh, the products that are brought by the business is going to be very much determined by the what the developer needs to meet the critical business needs. And that is where the gap is because the sellers are almost like a different planet or say a different country. And they don't know how to talk to a developers and developers do not like sales talk. They do not like being marketed to. They are a different set of people. They just want the best tools and the best insights and the best view to kind of deliver the best they can. Now, what's stopping these sales guys? It's a traditional adoption funnel that they are thinking of. Awareness, consideration, then there's a decision and there's deploy and use. That's not there any longer. Uh, in this whole world of technology adoption. But the funnel is broken. 
So if you look at the awareness piece, yes, there is awareness, consideration, decision, but that just brings them to an idea that, okay, I need to get more cognitive technology capability. Yes, I may want to do a bot later, but that doesn't mean that they're just going to go and do a POC or a trial now. They want to get deeper into it, which brings it to an other layer of awareness, consideration, decision. So um, this is where the funnel is really broken. And the sales doesn't know how to bridge that gap. And developer relation knows uh, the whole developer ethos well and can make that connect with sellers. How do you do that? Well, this is El Marcos, the shortest bridge between Spain and Portugal. I was looking for international bridges uh, and came up on El Marco. I think we need to build El Marco between our sales organizations and the developer organizations. How do you do that? But to begin with, we need to meet the sales folks at a point, talk about our common agendas and create safe spaces for them to meet developers. They do not know very well how to talk to developers or meet developers and developers benefit because um, the salespeople, once they make the sales, then they'll get their tool. So developers will benefit, but there is this gap. So it's up to us, the developer relations team, to make safe spaces. And that means uh, maybe when they come to a developer meetup or come to a hackathon, create a space of conversation between the business need and technology. That's a sweet spot where they can meet. Mm. Processes for engagement. Uh, there needs to be clear process for when seller can reach out to us for introduction to developers within the organization. Or we, when we think the time is right to introduce a certain dev team to the seller, uh, we need a process to do that engagement. So wherever you are in your maturity on this, within your organization, you have to think about the processes. And as you think about processes, set boundaries because the dev rel sometimes sits under marketing, sometimes it sits under sales, but you do not want um, uh, to be to lose our superpowers we really have superpowers and if we should not lose our superpowers then we should not be bound to sales metrics neither are we entirely on the marketing metrics and so we need our boundaries very nicely set and that means communication upward making uh, senior leadership understand uh, this the superpowers we have and hence a special value we bring etc and of course uh, metrics that matter, relatable insights, sellers should have developer KPIs, if you ask me, and things like that. So that's one way to do this. So let's do less of this, where either we are fighting or we are indifferent of each other. And let's do more of this. This is uh, Mel Gibson and uh, his partner. Um, and you know how they were very different personalities in that movie and made the biggest breakthroughs by joining forces. And we can, sellers and developer relations have a common agenda. Um, and that's what we need to somehow garner. Satya talks very beautifully about uh, his primary job being curating the culture. So all of this comes together. Fluidity of network, growth mindset, rapid experimentation, speed, there's a bunch of things here. But it's entirely about cultural shift, creating that cultural synergy between sellers and developer relations, if you will, in our process. So my call to you is to trust yourself and take a seat at the table and start having that conversation with sellers, um, with developers, bring them together and unlock a lot of potential in the meantime. So start building that bridge today. Thank you so much. So uh, we have uh, uh, one question right now. So uh, you said, uh, uh, for example, the Philippines case. So uh, you said uh, uh, over 1,000 1, over people gathering together to resolve the problem. How to communicate each other and the synchronize information uh, on the uh, 10,000 more people, it's a lot. 
right <laughs> and and um, uh, this is a question i asked winston in the beginning is how are you going to manage this and then uh, there was some part we could help uh, he started off with the slack um, uh, group and then broke them into teams and very quickly figured that and every night four hours there were these slack meetings and very quickly figured that this was not going to solve the problem and uh, we introduced them to github and um, then they started working with github and they used devops uh, and that is how they got structure very quickly into that and um, started each of those different teams started working together and then they had this uh, slack call still happened uh, because that's a face-to-face a, -face, um, a quick scrum meetings and all of that happened there but definitely uh, tools tooling helped mm, i see and uh, i have uh, some questions so uh, sales team and uh, uh, developer team have to know each other and uh, uh, they are not enemies enemies so we have to uh, looking for the company's goals but uh, in the Microsoft has changed in the CEO and uh, uh, see they Microsoft changed the mind very quickly so but uh, most of companies doesn't change CEO or executive so how to change their mind uh, casually or gradually right um... So it was not quickly with Microsoft either. <laughs> oh, I yes. think, yeah, I think it took about uh, three years or uh, from the time Satya came in. Um, but he quickly identified that culture is something that was his top priority and had to had to shift. And I'm not saying that at Microsoft sellers and developer relations are are like this. We're not. It's a journey, and we are on that journey. Um, so where do you get started? Uh, so from my experience, where we got started was initially to create those safe spaces for sellers so they can see what's happening with developers, meet developers and, and talk to them. And that we can easily do. When we have a meetup where you have um, a bunch of, uh, uh, say the topic is around DevOps and uh, if the sellers are not meeting the uh, developers, they're not coming to these meetups, definitely they are not going to understand this whole ethos and they'll always be scared of developers. So our first start was creating a pool of, uh, called for a volunteer army of uh, technical sellers and said, hey, uh, the value prop is that you need to know your customer. Your end user are developers. They're coming to these community meetups and they're talking about things different from what you are talking to that organization. These meetups are a great place for you to come and learn. Uh, so I would invite them. Uh, so I think we got a massive response initially because it's interesting that technical sellers want to do this. They never had an opportunity to do this. So at least 40 odd kind of signed up in the first week. Uh, itself and then um, we kind of allocated them and then worked with them we created a small teams group and then whenever we had opportunities for people to speak at community meetups we should we would bring them over but tell them very clearly that don't do your uh, sales pitch or your marketing pitch here talk to them from your heart talk about the value that product brings and what you saw in other customers so they're constantly developers and communities are looking for what am I missing? Is there something I have missed and somebody else is doing better? I want to improve. Uh, so their stories from other customers are great value prop for communities. So creating those safe spaces in communities and then within uh, customers as well uh, was a great deal. And once this started, they started calling us uh, to come meet some developers. Or when we met a group of developers, we would invite them. So that's how we started. I see it's very interesting stories and uh, oh yeah it's a time so uh, thank you Annie thank you for sharing your great experiences and uh, it's very interesting for me and uh, other uh, participants uh, so other speakers thank you so much thank you